My name's Monk Rowe for the Phileas Jazz Archive. I'm very pleased to have Steve Buckingham on campus today at Hamilton College. Thanks for being here. It's nice to be here in a blizzard or whatever this it is. It's really quite uh, Different from my annoying weather. outside, yes. Yeah. Um, but it's a beautiful campus. Yeah. Coming in last night, it looked like a career in Ives card. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, you've got quite a lengthy resume, and we're not going to get through all of it, but I wanted to talk uh, first about session musicians. Um, I've been lucky to interview some fairly well-known producers, um, a fellow named Joel Dorn, sure. George Avakian. Yeah. They were not, um, they didn't play instruments. And I'm wondering if your own, uh, being a guitarist and starting out as a session musician, has informed your production choices and skills? Well, it helped me, but I can tell you many producers who are not musicians or were not musicians. Um, Rick Hall in Muscle Shoals, Alabama could play, but he wasn't a great musician, but he was a great producer. I've known him, I could say, if you talk to 10 of us, how we got into it, you'll get 10 different stories. I actually didn't start as a session player. I was I came from Richmond, Virginia, and when I was 14, we started a band. Some friends, we started a little five-piece band because of the Beatles. And, but by the time I was uh, 19, we, and our band, we expanded into a big nine-piece band, big horn section, an R&B band. And we got on the circuit of backing a lot of black music artists like Jackie Wilson, The Impressions, and so on. And we would be their backup band through Virginia or North Carolina and South Carolina. So the Drifters, who carried just a guitar player, I don't know his name, but he was amazing from New York. So I got to play with a lot of those people as a teenager. But when I was 19, our band went to Baltimore to record a record, a single. And the engineer was George Massenburg, who's my longest friend in the business, 50 years now. Yeah. George besides being a world-renowned engineer, invented a lot of the equipment that's used in studios, uh, parametric equalization and so on. George and I became friends that one day in 69, and he asked me, it was a Sunday, that all everybody else had to go back to go to school, which I was supposed to do, go back to University of Richmond on Monday morning. Some, everybody went back but me. He said, do you want to stay over and watch me mix tomorrow, Monday morning? I said, yeah. So stayed over, go to the studio on Monday morning, and we're in one studio in Baltimore. And this was, of course, four-track recording. I love it, yeah. And um, the, in another studio across the hall, I saw these guys walking in with guitar cases and stuff. I said, who are they? He said, they're studio musicians. And I said, well, he, he said, they're here to play on somebody's record or a jingle or something like that, and like the light bulb goes off. I got, took the bus home from Baltimore to Richmond and I put the tape, told my parents I wanted to become a studio guitar player. And they said, just finish college, do whatever you want, and I did. But I started playing the sessions while I was still in college. Did you read music? I taught myself theory and mm -hmm. how to read. I, I worked in a music store in Richmond, Don Warner Music, and Don Warner, um, gave me a book on music theory, a little thin book like this, and I taught myself theory, taught myself to read. I taught guitar. I'd stay about two weeks ahead of my students at that time. <laughs> I was still, I was a, young, a teenager, and, um, but then I started buying books, um, oh heck, different books on theory to teach myself. Um, and I, yeah, I could read when I was really playing sessions every day, seven days a week. You not only had to learn, you had those kind of charts, but you also, in the, especially Nashville, Memphis, Muscle Shoals, number charts. I had some, I've got some examples I'll show you, but do you know about number charts? I think I do, they call I'd, it like, you, I'd they, like you to. We just call it number charts, but they called it the Nashville number system. It was actually started by a vocal group called the Jordan Airs. And they could, played with Elvis, right? Well, they sang with everybody, yeah. Elvis, Ricky Nelson, everybody. But they developed that thing where they would listen to a tune, the demo, and they would the lyric sheet would be in it, and over every 
note, they would write one, four, six minor, which a key of C, you're talking about C, four would be F, six minor would be A minor. It's all relative. Everybody, every studio musician, if they didn't have perfect pitch, they had perfect relative pitch. You give them the root note and hit the next note, they'll tell you if it's a three, a four, five, six minor, and so on. It became very complicated with with flatted ninths and all that sort of thing, but it was all written out in numbers. I can show you some charts later. So I learned early, I could read number charts, which when you went to Muscle Shoals and those kind of places early on in my career, you had to read numbers. You had to write your own charts. They'd play the demo, and everybody would get to their pad, and you'd write just one, three, you know, three minor, four, six minor, whatever. You'd write everything, you'd write your basic chart out, and then you'd make notes for yourself. How did you divide the work up? Because usually you had multiple guitar players on a session. Sometimes. Um, usually two. Uh, sometimes one, some sessions three. I worked uh, in L.A. with uh, Tommy Tedesco, the Wrecking Crew, all those guys, and they could all read, as we say, they could read fly paper. Tedesco could read charts upside down. He could play charts upside down, <laughs> literally turn it over and play it backwards. He could read anything. But that's when I first heard of Glenn Campbell. He was one of the Wrecking Crew. He could not read, but he had such great ears. If he heard it one time, he could play it back, but he's one of the greatest studio guitar players I ever heard. So was Tedesco. But they were all, they could, if you've ever heard stuff Glenn Campbell did, just, he could play jazz. Tedesco, they could all play jazz. Every great studio musician I've known anywhere could play jazz, as well as country, pop, R&B. You had to do it. Not that we played on jazz sessions, but we all loved it, so we mm -hmm. could play it. When you went to do a session, invariably you're going to be playing music that you might not like. Yeah. How do you adjust your attitude towards that? Or you just have to be professional. Mm -hmm. you, were, you were hired guns, and you were only as good as your last record that you were playing on. So it was very competitive. Everybody wanted to be a studio player. Very few get through the keyhole. And especially back then, it's not so that way. It's almost a non-existent art now because of the way people make records. They very seldom hire studio musicians. In Nashville, they do. But uh, not like it used to be. It used to be literally three sessions, sometimes four sessions a day six or seven days a week. We would work all the time. And there was a generation or two ahead of us from the late 50s through the 60s, the Wrecking Crew in LA. Every major recording center had one or two rhythm sections. LA, it was the Wrecking Crew, which was a loosely knit group of great players, um, usually three guitars, two keyboards, electric bass, an upright bass. Uh, it was a multiple instrumentals, instrumentalist. In Nashville, it was the A-Team, the historic A-Team that played on the Owen Bradley, Patsy Cline records, and all those things for Chet. But they could, I mean, one of the great guitarists back in those days in the 60s was a fellow named Hank Garland. He played on, you know, rocking around the Christmas tree and all that kind of stuff. But he did a, he did a jazz album called um, Jazz Winds from a New Direction, I think. And he it was Joe Morello and, uh, mm. oh my gosh, the vibra, great vibraphone player, a young guy back then. But it was jazz players from New York that he cut this great jazz album. They could all play jazz. Check to play jazz. When you were doing this work as a session musician, were you like eyeing the producer and soaking that in? Yeah, the good ones and the bad ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you said about, you, yeah, there were days you showed up and it was just routine, but you had to be professional, like I was going to say. And it was the task at hand. You walk in, you hear the demo, they either handed you a chart or you wrote your own chart, and you would run it down one time to, if there were mistakes, make your notes what you were supposed to do. And then you would use, we'd usually get it, and me as a producer too, with the players I worked with, you'd get it in usually the first, second, or third take. Mm 
You had to. If it took longer than that, then you're running, you know, it was a time we would, th sessions are divided into three hour segments, usually 10 in the morning to one, one hour break, two to five, six to nine, and then if it was a fourth, it would be 10 to one in the morning, which we love because after midnight you got paid triple scale or something. We were double scale musicians. Uh, it, some of the guys got so busy, especially in LA, like Larry Carlton, they started charging triple scale to try to discourage the sessions, but they still got hired. But they were so good. Uh, and again, like Larry can play anything. When you became a producer, and I'm, I'm thinking about people coming out of music schools and so forth and they want to get into this whatever's left of the business, you assume that these musicians are good players, but what else do they have to bring or not bring in order to keep getting hired again? That's a good thing you just said, or not bring. One of the great session guitarists of all time who just died in January, Reggie Young, who played on thousands of records, uh, Son of a Preacher Man, Dusty Springfield, um, Drift Away, Dobie Gray, all this kind of stuff. Reggie was one of my idols. And one time he told me, it's what you don't play. You got to, and another, I can't remember who it was, said, you know, air is a note too. Open oh. space is a note. And Reggie, that, that was one of his things I learned. It's what you don't play. You don't play all over the place. That's where most people make their mistake. They come in and like, look what I can do. It's, you have to play as an ensemble immediately. Now, as guys you have worked with, in most cases, but in some cases you've not worked with them, but you have to come together literally on the rundown as a, a band. You have to be a band like you've played together for years together on the rundown. And you have to be an ensemble immediately. And that's what separates the ones who want to do it from the ones who did it. So I think that's one of the oh, things. Okay. There are more things. And you heard, uh, you usually hear a demo, but when you were recording the background track. The rhythm track. The rhythm track. Were you hearing a singer? Yes. Okay. If it wasn't the artist, there'd be somebody in there, they call it the scratch vocal. Yeah. Uh, usually the artist was there. I can think of only a few occasions. If something happened, we had to cut a track without the artist being there. The artist was always there, anywhere, only either coast. And uh, yeah, they'd be in the booth doing their scratch vocal, but a lot of times we would nail it on the first take. The rundown, mm -hmm. and we do a second of you know we do the rundown, then take one, take two, and go back and keep the rundown. There's something that, uh, and sometimes the, the vocals were that way too. No kid, just right off the floor. Everybody playing at the same time. Yeah, yeah. and in case you know, if you've seen the standing in the shadows of Motown, where everybody was crammed into that one room, and sometimes with strings and brass and background singers, I mean, just crammed into one room, and they weren't wearing headphones. By the time I started playing, everybody was wearing headphones. Uh, we'd be in a room together, and usually it was a five-piece rhythm section, six-piece rhythm section, but I also did things where we were live with strings, and sometimes strings, brass, and woodwinds. And that's, that was in LA for big dates. Um, and the, you know, you can't, you just don't, you can't screw up. You've got to, you don't want to be the guy that makes them start over again. <laughs> Especially, and I came along when there were still guys playing who would, when it was direct to disc. And if you screwed up, it goes in the trash can, put another disc on and cut. The, it was not going to tape in the old, old days. It was going to disc, a lacquer. Wow. And, um, Literally, they'd be throwing them in the trash can, the guys told me. And I did some direct to disc recording in L.A. And it was, I mean, it was always, the pressure was on, but you didn't show it. And um, you just had to deliver really quick. And that's another thing, that is the quick mind, the quick inventive mind, creative mind. You have to create those licks, memorable licks on the spot, especially guitar players and keyboard players. So what happens if a producer comes out and maybe they played guitar once and they're trying to tell you, you know, do it, do it like this, and they're holding their hands out and they're going like that, and, and you know that that's not the thing to do. Yep, many times. Uh, 
I learned as much from the great producers and the bad producers as I did from the great producers what not to do. <clears throat> I could play. A lot of producers couldn't play, but they were also some great producers who didn't play. But, um, oh gosh, I've had them stand there in front of me humming something that had nothing to do with the track, the te demo or the track, and you know, just nod, and then you do it the way you know it should be done. And then you go in the control room and say, thanks for that input, that, thanks for that direction. Because a producer is really, I, like I've always said, a producer in music is more like a film director. You're picking all the, you pick the location, the studio, you pick the tech crew, your engineers, you pick the musicians who are like the bit players or whatever, and the artist is the artist, and the script is the, the, is the song with the lyrics. It's more, it's a misnomer. A music producer is more like a film director in music. That's, the, that's I, it in a nutshell. I'm glad you brought that up. Warren Keepnews described himself as a catalytic agent. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> You have to be as a producer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to, you have to walk that tightrope between a creative artist and these highly accomplished musicians and the technical guys. You've got to know the technical. And back then, the technical part, like I was telling this class today here, the recording class. You know, we recorded on these giant analog consoles, which are still the best. And well, when I first started, it was four track. Then we went to George Massenburg and I went to Philadelphia to record Sigma Sound because they had an 8-track. But I started out on 4-track, then 8-track, then 16, then 24, and then the digital stuff came in. But we, I was showing pictures today from the old days of those giant consoles which still are in just a few studios now because they're dinosaurs yeah. and they're so expensive. Like I told them today, the mics in these studios, they'd have over a million dollars in microphones, oh, just vintage microphones. Yeah. And all the engineers I worked, well, there's only been a few that I've used consistently. And they had their own racks of gear that would be wheeled into the studio in the control room. you know equalization, compression, the mic preamps, the microphones, but most of the great studios like Capitol in LA had millions of dollars, they still do, millions of dollars in vintage microphones. A single mic, like a classic Neumann or Telefunken mm -hmm. or AKG, whatever, it could be 15 grand now, a single microphone. So people trying to record now can't afford a console that would stretch from the wall over to here, and yeah. it'd take three of us at the console. Right. And they so can't, nobody can afford that now. Does unlimited digital tracks necessarily make for better music? No, no, because we make great records on four tracks. The Beatles cut Sgt. Pepper's on a four track, I think synced to another four track. Yeah. And it was a technique, if you had four tracks, track one might be like George Martin, with the Beatles. Track one would maybe be McCartney and Ringo. They'd mix the drums and the bass on track one. Track two might be, would be the guitars and the bass mixed together. But you had to get all those levels set before you recorded. And then here's track one, bass and drums, all the drums. You know, it came to the point where we were using eight tracks just to record drums. Yeah. It still do. But it mixed the bass and drums, the guitars, and keyboard. Here's a vocal on track three. You'd leave track four open. And then to open up new tracks, you'd bounce it down, they called it. You'd, put, you'd mix track one with track two. The bass, drums, and the guitars, bounce them over track four, and you'd open up two tracks here to put whatever, background vocals. Um, uh, another a sax or something that wasn't on the date and then you keep bouncing things. Mm -hmm. it, of course in analog every time you bounce from one track to another you lose a generation so the sound degrades mm -hmm. a little bit but that's the only way you could do it. So that's what they did like George Martin with the Beatles. Bouncing tracks to open up new tracks because if you listen to that stuff obviously it's multiple tracks yeah. of things and that was when it was just four tracks two four-track machines synced together and eventually an eight-track machine. But that, that I don't think they ever recorded. Well, maybe later, in the late 60s, before mm -hmm. they broke up, they may have been on a 16-track. Right. But now, when you say, 
does more tracks make it? But no, it just it gives you more stuff to put on there and try to filter your way through. Mm -hmm. And somebody asked me today in this recording class, the sound now is opposed to then, I said, well, everybody now listens with earbuds through their cell phone or a computer, and it has to be compressed so much. And the, that sound back in, in my home music room, I've got old 1969 JBL speakers this tall, and I, that's the way I like to listen, like in a control room. I can't stand this sound, because it's so compressed, and it's squashed down. It's a di totally different, but that's all anybody, that's the, there's no yardstick now like it used to be. You had to make your record sound as good as Tom Dowd in New York or Al Schmidt in LA or something like that. Yeah, I can remember some producers saying, you've got to, you've got to keep in mind that a lot of people are going to listen to this in their two-inch speakers in their car. So they would do a mix where they were just listening to these very small monitors. Yeah, but we still do. We have <laughs> the big... In the, con in the control room, you have the big built-in mon uh, monitors in the wall, these huge custom-made things. And then you have the midfield speakers, maybe about that tall, sitting out in front of the console. And then up on your console, you'd have two, usually Yamaha NS10 speakers, about like the, the near-field monitors. But in the center of the console, we used to do it, because when you talk about two speakers in a car. You remember when I was doing started, it was one speaker, it was mono in a car. Yeah. So in the center of the console we had a little square speaker called an aura tone. A U R A T O N E. And we would hear that up there, the big sound, listen to the mid range, the near field monitors, and then we'd listen with the the little R tone just to make sure that the the main thing you had to make sure of the vocal was up above the music. I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, I'm showing my age, but if I have the 60s channel on and mm -hmm. I'm hearing any number of things, Dusty Springfield or anything, like th th there's no straining to hear what she's saying. No. Now, if I turn on current music and, you know, here we go, current music, but I'm always straining, even with like maybe Tom Petty or those kind of people, what's he saying? Like, I'm listening hard. Yeah. It, is it your feeling that the music and the bass have come up and the vocal hasn't come with it? You've got to understand, again, where it's going now. It's all compressed so much. It squashes all the music and the vocal. And um, but Tom Petty, at least, recorded in real studios. Not that, you know, now it's just... it's. People who are trying to get in the business are doing, you know, they do it on their computer. They have all the plugins where we had millions of dollars of equipment in the control room. Now you can, you can access a similar sound on a computer. But we, one of the things, I mean, this goes back to the 40s with Sinatra and people. Uh, the vocal had to be here and the music had to be here. You ha that had to. You, and we would listen really, I never listened really loud in the control room, ever, even as a studio player. I always listened at a real low level to really hear where the vocal was sitting, more so than everything else. Everything else, would, we could kind of mix ourselves as musicians. And, um, but you had to make sure the vocal was just right, you know, I always said I liked, I wanted to make, I'd, strive to make records that were transparent. You could walk into the mix and it would surround you and that's gone because everything is so compressed now. There's a few people that make records like that, but we took our cue from those days, the Sinatra days, Capitol Records, Nat Cole, Peggy Lee, Sinatra, all those people. I mean, I've worked in that studio, which thank God they made it into a landmark so they can't tear it up. Okay. Like most of them are gone. Yeah. Here's two phrases I've heard um, in the studio work I was able to do. We'll fix it in the mix. Bad. <laughs> no, it either comes off the floor, as we say, comes off the floor with the musicians into, the, you know, it's got to be there off the floor. Fix it in the mix is it's just like vocal tuning. You know, the, you know what a vocal tuner is. Everybody uses vocal oh, oh, tuning now, okay. tuning the vocals which I never did because I always worked with artists who were, I, first of all, I don't like the sound of vocal tuning. 
people have gotten to the point they use it almost as an effect on the vocal. Vocals are tuned to death. I can hear it immediately. And um, they use it almost as an effect now. And not only that, the vocals are artificially doubled or tripled. The lead vocals mm. and so many things I hear. Okay. I, can't, I can't handle it. When I'm in a restaurant, I have to get up and leave. I'm not putting it down. It's just not what I grew up. Here I did. I just hit the mic. <laughs> uh, I'm expressive. So, but anyway, no fixing in the mix is BS. Okay. If it's not there off the floor immediately, you can't fix it. In the, well, for us, you couldn't fix it in the mix. It had to be right from the, the start. Okay. The What's other the one. Other the other one was uh, like if you're doing overdubs and the, you do it, and the producer says, "That was perfect. Let's do another one." Oh, and I went through that, but uh, most of the producers, when I was a session player, most of the producers I worked with, luckily, were great producers, and they knew to cop capture the spontaneity, and that's what I always tried to do. That's why we always, uh, when I was starting out as a producer, I knew when they were running down the chart to make sure everything was right, I would always record the rundown. And then we do take one, take two, maybe a take three. And I tell you, it was a lot of times I used the rundown and the scratch vocal. I'll be darned. But we never, I can't think of any time as a player or as a producer that I went more than three takes. The rundown in three takes, it had to be. Because you were trying, you know, as they said, one of the expressions that is true, time is money. But in those days, time really was money. You were paying those studio musicians, you were paying for that studio, and you were paying for those engineers, and the clock was running, as they said. And in the old days, a light would come on when it was time to record this recording, this red light. And people would, if they weren't used to it, they'd freak out. As soon as the light went on, they said, they couldn't handle it. This, you know, they could play until the light went on, and then they froze up. But they did away with it. the light, as we used to call it. The light's on. But you could see it, it would reflect all around in the windows in the control room that the light was on. I see. Who needs that kind of pressure? You're already under. Yeah, well, it. you learn to do it. But some people couldn't do it when the light went on. Fascinating stuff. Um, as a producer, we, we talked about liking or disliking music as a session musician and it doesn't really matter. You have to play everything equally as well. As a producer, have you been in situations where um, you were hired to produce music that you didn't like? No. Or, no. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, or an artist that you didn't really get along with. No. There's only been in, gosh, I produced my first record in 1977. And I can only think of two times, no, maybe once, there was an artist uh, on Capitol in LA, and I'd heard a record that she had made by a well respected, at that time, very rare female producer in Philadelphia who's passed away, Linda Creed, great producer. And uh, I heard this record that Linda Creed had done on this female artist, and, I, and then Capitol said they wanted me to produce an album on her, and I, you know, went out and met with her in L.A., went over songs, sat there, went over the keys, it, it, but she never would sing like, you know, I was always kind of leaning in, like, I can't quite hear how she really sounds and everything, and the first day we got in the studio, it was a train wreck, and I mean, I had the best players and engineers, studio, everything, but it wasn't there, you know, fixing that in the mix, no. You couldn't fix something like that. And I went home, I called the session early and went home, I called Linda Creed in Philadelphia and I said, I'm working this thing with so-and-so and I said, I've heard the album you did on it. She said, how far are you into it? And I said, I called the session early today. She said, get out now. Wow. And uh, that's the only session I can ever remember that I stopped. And, called Capitol and said, this is a fraud. The artist obviously will remain nameless. But um, I, the other thing, when you're saying, did I do things with people I didn't get along with or music I didn't like, I just didn't take those projects. I didn't take them. 
Mm -hmm. I only worked with the people I really wanted to work with. Did you ever have uh, significant recording done? You had an investment in this session, and turns out the singer couldn't cut it and bring in another singer? No. Okay. No. The closest I came to that was a, a female trio from Motown, not the Supremes. Um, and again, I'd heard an album they had done, and I wanted to do it because I was doing a lot of stuff for Motown then, and, you know, Smokey Robinson and all these people, Barry Gordy and all this kind of stuff. So I wanted to do, the, I was doing Motown sessions as a producer. And this trio, though, it, it was, it, it, on the first song you realize they can't do it. So I actually recorded them. We did the session and I wanted to please Smokey because he was like kind of the hit, the unofficial head of A&R at Motown when they had moved out, well, in Detroit as well as in L.A. Uh, this was when they were in L.A. And I wanted to, I wasn't doing it for Barry Gore, I was doing it for Smokey Robinson. I wanted to please Smokey Robinson because he's a great writer and producer and artist. And so I brought in ringers out in L.A. Uh, there's a great background vocal group called the Water Sisters. And I use them on lots of records. And that entire album is basically, maybe that lead singer from that trio, but the, it's basically the Water Sisters. And they know it. And that was not uncommon, something like that to happen. That's the only other, the one I told you about and that one is the only two times. And the, the reason I stuck with that is because I wanted to please Smokey Robinson. I did other records, Betty Labette and different people from Motown. And it was to get Smokey's seal of approval. That was a big deal. And you got Because here's the guy who wrote and produced My Girl on the Temptations, among all the other stuff he did yeah. with the Miracles and his group, and amazing artist and producer and writer. I wanted to please Smokey. Do you have a built in um, detection system for things that you or other people might want to include? on a song, like a really cool part, or let's put a lute on it or something, and it sounds like a good idea, but it's not relevant to the song. I can't think of anything like that. I always kept a legal pad in front of me when I was pr producing. Uh, I took some of my pads today for them to see where uh, each song, I'd have, you know, intro, verse one, Sometimes you'd have a bridge going to the chorus or a channel, we called it, going to a chorus. Then there'd be a short turnaround then the second verse. And so I'd have everything, each song, I'd write, as they were recording, I'd write down who would do the fills here. Where would the piano fill halfway through the first verse? Where would the guitar do fill? Because that's the whole thing about studio playing is the fills in between the vocals. If you listen to great records, those guys are not just noodling all the way through the song. They're laying back until it's that space for them to do their fill, whether it's a piano lick or a guitar lick. But I would also make notes for overdubs like sax, uh, solo, or, you know, a turn, you know, usually it'd be a solo with a, some like alto, the first <laughs> record I ever produced, I Love the Nightlife, which by the grace of God became a hit all over the world. I did oh. that modulation and that Alto sax solo. I can I can hear it now yeah, that you said that. Yeah. And I just said I told him I said I want this to sound like New York on a rainy night. And if you listen to that alto solo, it was by a guy named Jay Scott, who couldn't read music, but he had an amazing sound. And he did that thing with the alto and the tenor at the same time, and all that sort of thing. <laughs> it, not in the studio, of right. course, but he could do it. But that alto solo in Nightlife, I just said Wet Streets of New York. And that was, I think, the second take, that solo. That was an overdub. It wasn't off the floor live. But as far as, I don't think I ever added a lute to anything, but sometimes I'd make a note for an English horn or a bassoon or something like that. When I would do orchestra dates, and then I'd have whatever the instrument I wanted to feature, sometimes a couple of French horns or something like that. We'd have them mic certain ways. You had to, there was a, a real technique to mic in 
a string section in an orchestra of brass and woodwinds and that type of thing. But I would make notes about, I put, you know, bassoon, question mark, you know, and <laughs> then come back and when we did the orchestra dates in L.A., that's when I would add that sort of thing. I don't think I ever added a lute to anything. No, okay. <laughs> I know I've worked could've, with could've Irish been. groups and we had the penny whistles and the whistles and the alien pipes and all that kind of stuff, but I don't think I ever, if I had a lute on a song, I'm not familiar with it. Okay. When you get uh, contracted or hired to produce a record with a person you've never met, or I guess I should ask first, has that happened? Yeah. Okay. What you would end up meeting them way before you that's, go in the that's studio. That's my question. Yeah. Like, what's the first interaction like? A meeting. Um, after I did I Love the Nightlife, the next person that called me was Clive Davis and flew me to New York. And he quizzed me. He played me demos of songs. He'd play me records that they were getting ready to release. And he would be very specific. Is, do you think this is a hit? Why? Or why not? He was very specific. And we were there hours the first time I met with Clive in New York. And we left that after that first day. And he said, put together some song. He's a song man to this day. He's about 86 or so now. And um, still the chairman of Sony, BMG, or wherever, you know, whatever it is now. And, um, and he said, put together some songs and send them to me. And I did. I got, I think, six songs together from the few writers I knew. A couple of guys in L.A., one guy in Muscle Shoals. And I put together a reel-to-reel -reel tape back then. It was before cassette and sent him a reel-to-reel -reel of six songs. And within a couple of days, I get a call from the secretary. He said, come to New York. Clive wants to meet with you. Went to New York. And out of the six songs I sent him, he loved four of them. And if you ever worked with Clive Davis, I didn't know it then, but he could go to 200 songs and turn them all down. He was so critical. He was a, he's a real song man. Not a musician, but a song man. And a record man. Anyway, he we played the four songs, and he was asking me my ideas about the production of, from the demos, the writer's demos. And then he started playing me songs, and I'd say, I hear that one. I don't hear that. Anyway, at the end of that day, he said, um, I'm flying you tonight to Los Angeles to meet with Melissa Manchester. Oh, wow. Uh, to do her next album, and Melissa was, I uh, did, that's how it started, you know, you're saying, how does you meet, well, I flew out, met with her manager and her, her manager's house the next day, and thank goodness it worked when we did, our first album was successful, our second album, and we, we did a Christmas album in the late 90s, I mean, we're still friends, I just went to see her play a few months ago, a couple of months ago, we're still great friends. But that's, that's usually, how you, you have to meet with them ahead of time to see if there's a chemistry. What's the first run through of the songs like? You have, you have a piano player on hand or did you play your guitar or? Well, you mean when I met with, like her yeah. with the song? I had demos. I had demo tapes. Okay. Uh, now Melissa's a great piano player, um, but when I was, would, usually I'd meet with an artist, I'd have demo tapes of songs, if they, a lot of times like with Dolly or somebody, they're great writers. Melissa's a good writer, great writer, and um, they would always have input about their songs, and it would be, again, like, yes, no, I hear this, I don't hear that one, and you, it's just a process you go through, and it's, it would be very methodical and very thorough so that when you got to the studio, there was not going to be any surprises. You had your material picked. You'd usually, well, you'd always overcut, as we said, because on vinyl you had, whatever, 17 minutes a side. You could do five or six cuts per side on a vinyl album. After that, you could, it just wouldn't hold it on the inside grooves. So, you, but you would cut 15 or 16 songs to pick your 10 or 12 on every every project I ever did. I think, I think for sure. Um, and you call them out, as they say, for the end, did the, the final ones. Did the things that got called out ever make it to the next record? 
Not that I know of. Okay. I know they've done like re-releases on things, yeah. later re-releases, hidden gems. Hidden that kind gems. Of, now yeah, we have more that, time on the CD. We can yeah. we can pull in. And you know, and yeah, and they do that sort of thing. And occasionally, I'll, I will hear something that was we recorded and mixed, but it didn't make the album. But it turns up on somebody's hidden gems album, whatever you want to call those, the unreleased. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's interesting because there's a few LPs that I, I loved so much and when they became reissued on CD they added some songs in. You got room. And, and I didn't like it. Yeah, well. <laughs> it's sort of like messed with the, the, the vibe of the whole record or something. I always try to tell a story with an album. You put the needle on, in what side one, turn over, needle on, all the way, it was a story because people did really listen top to bottom, which is a lost art now because everybody listens to a track here or a track there. They download a track or they stream a track, but not an album. It used to be the album had to tell a story musically. It had to be. Going back to the, when Sinatra started doing that stuff with Nelson Riddle in the 50s, those were concept albums, probably the first concept albums. The Sinatra albums with Nelson Riddle at Capitol. Capitol. He'd been on Columbia, and it was not It wasn't good. Mitch Miller in New York. But when he got with Capitol in L.A., and especially with Nelson Riddle and Axel Stordahl and um, oh, the great trumpet player um, Billy, Billy May. May. Yeah. Oh my gosh, those are phenomenal concept records. You put on, you know. We Small Hours, any of those albums. You can you drop a needle and you go all the way through. It's a story. It's a novel. It's, it's very interesting the fact that a lot of the sidemen, the swing musicians, after the big band era petered out, that they could walk into those studios and work. They were skilled enough yep. to make that happen. Did you? In New York and L.A., and I was lucky enough to come along when there were still a lot of those guys around. The orchestra guy, you know, the brass, woodwinds, and the string players. They were old Hollywood guys. They played on the movies, you know, going back into the late 40s and through the 50s. And they were phenomenal. You, you had a concert master and the whole, it was for real. And it was, we usually cut our strings 12, 4, 4, and 2, 12 violins, 4 viola, 4 celli, 2 double basses, upright basses. And I would have to pay them, but if once we got that, it was really quick with the charts. The main thing was to run it down, to correct mistakes in the chart. You'd circle things up on the stand with the conductor, and they would then the copyist would be there, the arranger, and they would t on bar 64 change the E to an E flat, that type of thing for each. If there was a mistake in the charts or something didn't fit right, but then. It was always first or second take, mm -hmm. and then I would double the strings and sometimes triple them. But we wouldn't just triple them with the same. We'd move the mics a little bit. The, oh. it was mic they were all mic'd up like this. Some were close mic'd, but if there was a little step out with this violin or something, we'd close mic that. But everything else was overheads, like you mic a classical orchestra, and um, you had to get it quick with that many people in the studio. Sometimes, I mean. If you had a 12, 4, 4, and 2 string section, but then if you were adding brass, I mean, I think the, the largest section I ever did was maybe 65 pieces at once, including live drums and live bass and live guitar and live piano. That you were holding your breath for. <laughs> you, you know, there's a great engineer producer out in LA named Al Schmidt, who's in his late 80s now. And I think he won a Grammy two years ago. He started out when he was a kid in New York. He's one of the masters of all time. And he recorded in the early 60s, Sam Cooke and people like that, up through Nora Jones and all, you know, he's still winning Grammys. He's won, I think, 20, 22 Grammys. And Al told me one time, uh, when I had one of those big dates, a room full of players, and one of those another words of wisdom, don't just don't let them see you sweat. You always have to act confident. You can't let them see that you're nervous 
I don't care if it's four people out there or 64 people out there. You can't let them see you sweat. You've got to act confident, even if you think, oh, my God. And I've had times where it was 35 people sitting out there, and a machine, a tape machine would break right before the session, and we'd have to sit there for an hour looking at your watch. And they're looking at the, their watches because they know they're only there for three hours, maybe two sessions, six hours. And you got to get it. One way the tape machine broke one time, and we wasted an hour while they fixed that. The studio was not going to pay for those musicians. But we had to cram into two hours what we would have done in three hours. But usually we would, we'd get uh, dates, string dates done, orchestra dates. we get three or four songs in a three-hour session. Oh. And we would, same way with the rhythm section, we would almost always get at least three songs in a three-hour session. That was just expected of you. And those guys that came out of the old Hollywood days or the old New York days, those big band players, I knew guys, there were guys that played with Glenn Miller, Tommy Dorsey, all these guys that ended up in L.A. particularly playing on movie dates. And um, they were, I mean, of course, not only were they great musicians, but the stories they had were oh, just unbelievable. A good friend of mine that became, I'm sure you've heard of the piano player and composer Mel Powell. Mm -hmm. He played, When he was 18 years old, he was hired by Benny Goodman to replace Teddy Wilson. And Mel Powell and I became great friends in the early 90s. He couldn't play anymore. He had a degenerative nerve thing. But he said, oh, that's okay. Oh. He said, Paul Hindemith taught me to compose here, not here. In fact, it was Paul Hindemith. I bought three of his theory books when I was starting out. And that's how I learned theory was Hindemith. That's who the name I was trying to come up with. Anyway, Hindemith taught me to compose here, not here. So he was still composing. But if you listen to those old Goodman records with Peggy Lee and Mel Powell on piano, a phenomenal player. And then he went from there, he got drafted, and Glenn Miller had already gone into the Army, and he got every big band player, every key guy from Dorsey, every but Goodman. He had Mel Powell in that Army Air Force band in Europe. Yeah. It was like the cream of the big band crop, and I got to know a lot of those guys. And, oh my gosh, could they play? I mean... They could all play. Yeah. I had a funny, Aunt Manny album had a funny anecdote about, I think he was producing the Guess Who. Who was it? Manny album. I don't know. Anyway, the band, you know, struggled Guess for. Guess Who, I remember, sure. The, the band struggled for like two or three days to get the rhythm track down, and then he calls in all these pros and guys like Bill Watts. And, they, and the band's going, oh, how yeah. did they do that? He goes, well, they play music, you know, like, <laughs> anyway, yeah, it's pretty well, funny. The thing is, um, there's a lot of records by rock bands from the day. The Beatles played their own stuff, of course, but there, are, there were some well-known bands that were ghosted, as they say. It was, the, it was the Wrecking Crew in L.A. Yeah. On a lot of pop and rock records that were supposed to be the band playing. I won't tell you who, but you can find out. Yeah. But it was the same thing. Do you want to spend three days trying to cut a mediocre track or 20 minutes to cut an exceptional track? <laughs> Not guess a hard what, guess what wins. <laughs> but there were millions of dollars spent, tens of millions spent on bands trying to cut their own tracks. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were some certainly who could, but even like things like the birds, I mean, they played, but hey, Guess who else was in there playing 12-string? Glenn Campbell mm -hmm. is a player, yeah. a session player. Yeah. And, um, but that's just, that comes with the territory. You don't think, okay, they're out there making millions of dollars. I'm here making double scale. Right. And um, they're getting royalties. I'm not getting royalties. But that was your job. Did you ever, uh, this is an odd question, but did you ever have to break up any fist fights or the not like? Not among musicians. I did among artists on TV shows. Uh, there was a TV show called Midnight Special back mm -hmm. in the old days. And I, again, I won't go into who. There's two female artists, and I was in the control room. I heard this commotion, and they literally, they were out there duking it out in the hallway. And I did have to get in the middle of that one. 
Uh, but no, not among the really pro, not okay. among the musicians, and certainly professional artists. None, none, nothing like that. That was the only time. There were times I had to uh, call someone aside and tell them they weren't in shape to play on the date that day for various reasons. Mm -hmm. And I just said, you know, call it a day. Uh, you'll still sign the, sign the card, as we said, the session card. You'll still get paid, but. You need to pack it in today. You, you just you're not on today. It would usually be for what you can imagine: drugs, alcohol. Something yeah, and like that. if they did that too many times, that's it. Word, bad news travels fast. Oh, uh -huh. yep. The guys were tell, some of the guys were even telling me that they, if they had to go out of town, they tried not to let people know, because as a session musician, if your phone rings and you don't pick up, then yeah. Well, it was so busy back then, you had, everybody had an answering service. And every, after every session, you, everybody would be out in the hall on their, on the, not cell phones, on the pay phones, calling their service to see what dates were booked for them the next day or the next week or that type of thing. And they'd be writing in their book. It was in, that's where cartage companies started up in L.A. Oh. Because guys like Hal Blaine, the drummer from the Wrecking Crew and those people, they had so many sessions. They may do a 10 o'clock session for whoever, but their 2 o'clock session may be a different artist in another studio. So to get the drum set from here over to the next studio, set up in mic, it was those guys who started thinking about, okay, I'll have three sets of drums. And while they were playing that session, the cartage companies, the big trucks that would take the equipment trunks to the next studio, and they would set up the drums, then the, the engineers could mic it. So. Hal Blaine could play drums over at Sunset Sound in the morning, take his lunch break, and at 2 o'clock he'd be at um, United Western Studio with his other drum set already set up, and maybe at 6 o'clock it'd be at a third studio with his third drum set. That's the way it was. Did, did the studios or the record companies ever try to uh, lock some of these people in? Like, oh, yeah. we just want you to work for us. Yeah, but not in L.A. Okay. And, and, um, in Muscle Shoals, uh, there was a, a great producer, Rick Hall, who died a year or two ago. And uh, Rick had his studio, still there, his grandson runs it, I think, Fame, Florence, Alabama Music Enterprises. And Rick, that's where Aretha went to cut the first hits on Atlantic. Her, she was on Columbia, never had a hit, but she got to Atlantic yeah. and bang, I never loved a man the way I loved you. It was at Rick's studio, although Jerry Wexler produced it, Tom Dowd engineered it, came down from New York. But Rick locked his rhythm section in the fame gang, they called him, and then some of them broke off and started Muscle Shoals Sound, which didn't go over well with Rick, but they all made up in the end. But they were players that started with Rick, and Rick was a big influence on me. I played sessions for him. We always said, if you can play a session for Rick Hall, you can play for anybody in the world. He was so tough. And he would hire, you'd show up, and it was not uncommon. There'd be three or four guitar players, two drummers, two keyboard players, a couple of bass players, and literally you'd sit out there, if you were in there, and he didn't like what you were doing after a couple of takes, bring in the next guy. And here comes the other guitar player and sits down with his amp and guitars, and I mean, he was tough. I mean, I saw seasoned session players leave sessions for Rick in tears, but he got what he wanted, and he, you can't, he, he cut too many hits for it to be an accident. He was a great producer, and I learned so much from Rick, but he tried to lock in his players, but they all branched out to form Muscle Shoals mm -hmm. Sound, that type of thing, but you couldn't do that with the guys in LA. They were too busy with not yeah. only playing record dates, but playing movie dates. Plus the union was... Uh, oh, the union it, was... You, I mean, I've been in the union since 1969. Mm -hmm. The union had nothing to do with that. Because no they, were paying, they were paying you no matter what. If you were part of the Muscle Shoals rhythm section or you were mm -hmm. freelancing, that you would go to Muscle Shoals to work with those guys. Everybody went there. Dylan, all these people. And um, but the union, you you got play, you got paid no matter what. Now scale in the old days was not great, like when I started out. But it it got better and better. And then I started paying 
like a lot of people. I started as a player. I was a double scale musician. Mm -hmm. Some of the guys, like Larry Carlton, when he was living in L.A., he was in Nashville now, but Larry would, um, he was so busy seven days a week, he went to triple scale, and some of the others, Tom Scott, the sax player, they all went to triple scale, thinking it would cut back on, the, but they kept paying them, and they were still working seven days a week, but making triple scale instead of double scale. Oh. Then on the other hand, there's, there's anecdotes like Jimmy Cobb, the drummer who played on uh, Kind of Blue, mm -hmm. he made like some, like less than a hundred bucks for that thing, and now it's well scale like i say is much different now yes. but okay. again not that many people use studio players anymore now right. i guess on like i say in national on country records it's still mostly studio guys um i know they still put together jazz groups to play in the studio but um kind of blue what year was that that was early uh, 60s? 59 i think yeah yeah gosh i doubt if scale then was even 54 bucks. Yeah, I think it was in the 40s or 50s for a three-hour session or something. I think when I started, it was like 75 bucks for okay. a three-hour session, and I went to double scale. Do you, do you get um, unexpected res checks in the mail? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't make royalties as a producer much anymore, um, but as a player, I remember it was a couple of years ago, I get this check for eighteen thousand dollars out of the blue and I called um, I guess I called the union I said what in the world is this for and it was something I had played on uh, they had, had used for an AT&T commercial a national commercial and they're bang out of the, we called it mailbox money your royalties and stuff like that and uh, but yeah every once in a while you get a nice surprise but back those guys like Carlton and Tom Scott and all them, every year you, you get your scale, whatever you were charging, double scale, triple scale, whatever, and then the union has a thing called special payments fund for recording musicians, and according to how many sessions you played that year, you'd also get your special payments check at the end of the year from the union. And it was not uncommon to see some guy try to drop up in a new Jaguar or something after a special payments check came in because they were big checks. For you, you know Tom Scott is, of course. Of course, yes. Well, he was the highest paid musician for a long time in L.A. His, his special payments checks were astronomical, and rightfully so. He was phenomenal. He is phenomenal. But he was the highest paid player in L.A. for a long, long time, by far. Just every, to come every, in every year, they'd say an unnamed reed player in Los Angeles. <laughs> okay. Again, is the you know had uh, the biggest special payment check. But everybody knew it was Tom Scott. That's good info. <laughs> well, I got to get in um, a thing about. Uh, I know you're passionate about black music and how it uh, affected bringing the races together. I did teach a, I taught a course at Vanderbilt yeah. for eight years. It's called Rhythm and Blues Tore Down yeah. the Walls of Segregation. I'm teaching it now at Virginia Wesleyan in Virginia Beach where I live now. I taught it at Vanderbilt for eight years, but mm -hmm. yeah, very passionate about that because I lived through it in the 60s. My band in Richmond, we became a, a really popular backup band for black artists. Back then, about the only there were very few artists that carried big band, you know bands. Uh, James Brown had his big 18-piece band, and they were like a machine. They were unbelievable. I get chills just thinking about that when I first saw that 18-piece. That curtain open up. Those guys are in tuxedos, you know, three drummers, two guitars, bass player, and then everything else, an organ player, and then everything else was brass and reeds all across the stage in tuxedos, not just playing, but doing the choreography and the whole thing. And then he hits the stage, and it's a three-hour, <laughs> another world. Ray Charles is a, one of the ones that had a big 18-piece band, the Ray Charles Orchestra with the Ray Letts singing background. Again, that was an experience, but very few black artists could afford that. Um, like when we played with the Drifters. They brought a guitarist with them from New York. I can't remember his, I don't know his name, but he was phenomenal. But I was playing second guitar behind him. Jackie Wilson, no band. We just had the charts and we would back the impressions. Jackie, was, Curtis Mayfield, the impression. Curtis Mayfield was a great mm -hmm. guitarist mm -hmm. and producer and writer and singer and a great guy, gentleman. I played second guitar behind Curtis Mayfield. 
But most black groups, Jackie Wilson, Otis Redding, occasionally Otis would have a band in, where they would augment it with some of us. And we, in Virginia and the Carolinas, we became like one of the key, what they called them, backup bands. Were you, were you an all-white band? Mm -hmm. So what kind of things did you witness playing behind these black artists? Well, the movie The Green Book, every black artist I knew had The Green Book to know where they could stay, where they could eat. Um, I, had to, I played with many black artists that we couldn't eat together and we certainly couldn't stay in the same place together. I went with them sometimes and stayed in some of those horrible places they had to stay in. They were bad, bad. But that's just, you know, and it was those towns like they talked about in the Green Book, you know, sundown towns. You had to be, they couldn't be out after dark or you had to have a damn good reason if the police stopped, and they usually did. And if they said, we just played a date here, and we had a bus, we had, our band had a bus, an old flexible bus that we had bunks in it and sofas and all that kind of thing back in the day, in the 60s. So they could travel with us, but we, gosh, I, I don't know how many times we were stopped. And they'd get on and they'd see black guys with white kids, and it was like hell to pay. I got arrested once in Norfolk, Virginia, we were back in a group from Norfolk called the Showman, a black uh, quartet or quintet. And it was all white kids dancing, and they raided the place, and we got arrested. Not the artists we were back, and we got arrested, and our charge was inciting a riot. And it was kids dancing, there was no riot. My father was the first sergeant in World War II, boy, he drove from Richmond down to Norfolk, and he read them the Riot Act, and get us out of jail. We were arrested more than once, I was myself because I played out with some other groups. But um, it was bad. It was, everything you've read about didn't double that. It was sometimes scary. But we got through, we're still living. Um, but I'll tell you this, we had a pistol on the bus. I did, I know, I don't even know what the other band members knew, but I always had a pistol in my bag. It was some tough things. I thank God didn't use it. Yeah. But uh, everything you saw in the Green Book, triple that. Mm. Yeah. And everything you've read about, triple that. Because it wasn't just the the police. It would have been the townspeople also, right? Yeah. They had town councils, and if they saw something about a black artist playing in town, believe me, the town council. The Citizens Council, they would call them in like the South, because we played, I played, besides my band, I played places in Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi was really scary. But uh, the Citizens Councils, they call them, which was just another name basically for the Klan, really was. And yeah, they came on the bus when I was playing with other people. and uh, or. Played one place one night, came out, and there was the cross burning outside. What year would that have been? 67, mm -hmm. 68. Um, oh, yeah. And I had friends who were white disc jockeys in Nashville. There was a big rhythm and blue. The biggest rhythm and blue station in the country was WLAC in Nashville. And there were white disc jockeys. Everybody thought they were black, the way they talked and the music they played. But they were friends of mine. and. More than once, they burned crosses out in front of WLAC because they were white kids were listening to black music, and that was a no-no for the city, the, the, the town council, city citizens councils. They call them. They'll just it was a front for the Klan, basically. But those kids who were dancing didn't care. They didn't care, right? No. That's what I talk about in my class. And that's where integration it was when John Hammond, who I'm sure you know, mm -hmm. knew or know of. Well, I was lucky enough to know John Hammond. When I, he worked at two labels, Columbia and Vanguard. I worked at two labels, Columbia and Vanguard. And I got to know Mr. Hammond in the 80s. He died in 87. But he was the guy who integrated the Goodman Band in 1935 by getting him to hire Teddy Wilson and then Lionel Hampton and then Charlie Christian. And he told me the stories that or just scary with the stuff he ran into. Then he's hired, then he signed Count Basie, then he signed Billy Holiday, and on and on. Then the 60s, Bob Dylan, Reetha. Springsteen, 
Well, he signed a wreath at a Columbia, but it was not successful. Columbia right. took her over and tried to make her into a pop singer. It wasn't until she went to Atlantic. But he told me all those stories, and um, what, a, what a guy. But he, I, I talk about my class. In 1935, when he convinced Benny Goodman to hire Teddy Wilson, which I said would be equivalent to, I don't know, whoever's out there now hand, hand, signing a man from Mars to there. It was front page, not entertainment section, it was front page, Goodman breaks the color barrier. I've got the headlines on film and stuff. But that was 12 years before Jackie Robinson went into the major leagues. It was music that integrated first. Now, before that, black and white musicians were getting together up in Harlem and playing at night. Mm -hmm. the, these joints Mel Powell and them told me about. They just couldn't tell anybody. They couldn't tell the sponsors or people about it. Otherwise, they'd be blackballed. Plus, they were playing together on recordings, right? But you couldn't... It wasn't until Hammond that they, they played integrated oh, sessions. Then he hired... Uh, I've got pictures of that Mr. Hammond gave me of um, John Hammond leading a section. It was uh, Benny Goodman, Freddie Green, Basie's guitarist, Basie playing piano, um, by Clayton playing trumpet. It was an integrated band, mm -hmm. but Goodman, John Hammond told me Goodman couldn't let other people know about that. Otherwise, the band would be banned for you know integrating yeah. in, behind the scenes. They played up in Harlem at nights in places in L.A., they would jam at night, especially in Harlem. But they, it wasn't until 35 when Hammond convinced Benny to hire Teddy Wilson that they integrated it, and that became headline news. Yep, it was music who integrated society. And like you say, the white kids, all they cared about, this, we loved this music. Back then, and when I was playing a lot in the 60s, and you know, when it was, it was white kids going to those dances. They weren't integrated dances for the most part. They were white audiences, or we play in black clubs with black artists and black audiences. This could be an impossible question, but as we wrap up here, um, you're at a cocktail party and you mention this course you teach and someone asks you, well, what makes black music black music? Well, that is a good question, but Duke Ellington had a great answer. He said, great music is great music, no matter what. I don't care if it's country, jazz, pop, big band, music, great music is great music. And that's really the way it is. And I know, I, th I think, in my prime, I could play black music as good as anybody. And I certainly worked, the guys in Muscle Shoals, that was an all white rhythm section. They played on all those massive Aretha hits. They, that sounded as black as anything could sound. So I don't think it's the, it's not the color of your skin, it's just like Booker T and the MGs in Memphis. Two white guys and two black guys. And they played on Otis Redding, Sam and Dave, Rufus and Carla Thomas, all those great records. It was an integrated rhythm section. But that was a segregated, Memphis was certainly a segregated city in the 60s. Mm -hmm. It was rough. But they, it was Booker T and EMGs, Booker T Jones, black on keyboards, Al Jackson Excellent. on drums, black, Steve Cropper, white on guitar, and Duck Dunn, white on bass. But that was as black as it yeah. sounded. I mean, that was really deep, funk, soul music. I mean, I remember getting fooled on a Paul Simon record. I said, that's got to be, that's Richard T. And it huh. wasn't, it was the guy from. Barry Muscle Beckett. Sh yeah, it was Barry. Barry was a dear friend of mine. He died 10 years ago or so, but yeah, well, I know Richard T and I know all those players. Cornell Dupree was one of my idols in New York on guitar, Rainy Night in Georgia and all that stuff. But Richard T was obviously magnificent as were a lot of guys, but Barry Beckett was as good as anybody. Paul Simon's still crazy after all these years where it's just Barry on the Fender Roads and Paul mm -hmm. Simon. And Barry told me that Paul made him do it in every key. I mean every key, A, B flat, B, C, C sharp. <laughs> he had to play it, and if you listen to Still Crazy after all these years, it's not an easy chord progression. Just to, you know, Barry wrote his numbers out. That's the great thing about a number chart. You can write the numbers out, hmm. and then, okay, I'll play it in A. Okay, let's do it in B flat, 
I still read the same numbers, I just go up a half a step. That was the great thing about a number chart. So he played all those versions of Still Crazy for Paul Simon from a number chart. And that when it was over, Paul Simon picked the take. And when you listen to it, it's a, it's a classic. And like you say, he could play as good as anybody, Richard yeah. T or any of those guys. And I saw all the great ones. When I first saw Aretha in 69, it was the King Curtis band. Cornell Dupree, Jerry Gemont on bass, uh, Billy Preston on organ, and Richard T on uh, electric piano, and um, a great horns. Uh, the drummer was uh, Bernard Purdy, Purdy Purdy. <laughs> Couldn't get anybody good. No. Enough. <laughs> and and besides the New York horn section, they brought in the Memphis horns. White two white guys and a black guy from Memphis to play. It was an unbelievable band. They opened the show, and then Aretha comes on. And that's the same thing when you see Aretha live at or record yeah. Aretha live at Fillmore West with when Ray Charles came. Paul Craven, that, that was that band. Yeah, Billy Preston playing organ for God's sakes. I mean, but I saw all those guys play, and uh, Tom Scott did one in New York called the New York Connection with all those Pretty mm -hmm. Purdy and all those guys. He'd hang up a sign when he was playing a session whatever it was, his 15,000th and 101 session, he'd have a little sign, he'd hang up every, it'd be a different sign for every... Tom Scott would? Or Bert, Tom Scott Bert, did an album there called, it was the LA yeah. Express, of course, yes. when they did okay. the Joni Mitchell stuff, but then he went to New York and did one called the New York Connection right, with, Bernard with all Purdy. those guys. Yeah. Well, okay. it may, I don't know if it was Pretty Purdy or if it may have been um, Steve Gadd, that's oh. who it was. That was the drummer on the Tom Who Scott finally won a Grammy, by the way. Steve Gadd? Steve Gadd did. He, he never won a Grammy? Nope. He won one. This year? This last, yes. We used to call him Bad Steve Gadd because he had this lick with the hi-hat that was like impossible. I mean, it was like 16th, 32nd notes. I mean, it was this crazy thing he could do with his left hand on the hi-hat. Bad Steve Gadd. Right. I'm sure he's still bad, too. Yeah. Well, I want to tell you I've really enjoyed this conversation. Me too. I know you have some people waiting for you. and I don't think it's for anything but dinner. So, so we'll book part two down the conversation Hopefully down the road. Hopefully they'll have me back. But uh, this is good. And it's good to talk to somebody who knows it, understands it. And I'm not talking about, again, jazz. I love jazz. I, I played, I produced jazz artists. I love great country music. I love great rhythm and blues. I love great pop music. Like Duke Ellington said, it's only great music. It's either good or it's bad. Mm. It doesn't matter what you label it. It's good or bad. And I appreciate the fact that you understand that. Well, on that note, thanks a lot. Thank you. Appreciate it.